Hello guys, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about Bob McKenzie's full 2022 NHL draft rankings being revealed. Originally, I wasn't going to make a video about this, but then the rankings came up and they are extremely interesting if I had to explain them in one word. But when it comes to the McKenzie rankings for 2022, what was his list? What are my thoughts on it? And could we see it happen in the 2022 NHL draft? Watch till the end for all the analysis, all the draft throws thoughts and make sure you hit that subscribe button to the channel if you haven't already 50 percent of you guys aren't subscribed so if you like draft content this channel is the place to be all right so before i show you this list i just want to prepare you because this top 32 is pretty crazy and if you don't know already with bob mckenzie's list it's not his own personal ranking he talks to 10 different scouts within the hockey world and they give him their rankings and he basically cultivates it into one ranking to get a good idea of what scouts around the hockey world and in the nhl are thinking which i think mostly points towards mckenzie's rankings being maybe more like a mock draft of where again these scouts are thinking and where these prospects could potentially go and especially in the past couple of years mckenzie's rankings have been pretty spot on and most of the rankings that we see are really what we'll see on draft day so they aren't really too far apart which again makes this top 32 that much more interesting now thankfully alex ak at gold caulfield on twitter ended up posting a lot of the rankings of this list and immediately at number one this is where the biggest surprise immediately at the start of the ranking comes and again from 10 different scouts and cultivating the rankings the number one prospect from bob McKenzie's list is Uri Slavkowski. Now, this doesn't mean necessarily the Habs will end up taking him, but that now that he is first overall and again surveying 10 different NHL scouts, that also does lead to the opinion that Uri Slavkowski might be the best prospect in the draft according to most people within the NHL. Now, Alex also had a tweet saying that of the 10 scouts that McKenzie pulled, five had Slavkowski, one, four had Wright, number one. So it was just above. And if he asked 10 other scouts, maybe they'd all have Wright number one. So this isn't really indicative of the entire NHL, but again, within 10 different NHL scouts, Uri Slavkowski was their number one pick. Now this got me peeved and I think for a very good reason. For me personally, especially for the Habs, taking Slavkowski would be a mistake. Although yes, the argument of they already have a two-way centerman in Nick Suzuki is an okay okay one. I don't think they need Slavkowski on the wings and I don't think even though you'd obviously be very akin to having that physicality on the team and that would be a big part of things I don't think Slavkowski's potential is as big as Shane Wright's and I don't think he's going to be nearly the player that Shane Wright can be. If we're talking about pure defensive ability, if we're talking about overall quickness and smarts and agility, to me Shane Wright has a lot of fundamental key elements that will translate well to the NHL level and to me especially with Slavkowski, if you're taking him number one you think he's NHL ready and to me with Slavkowski I think he might be another Capo Caco situation where if you rush him there could be some disastrous consequences right on the other hand I think could play really really solidly in year one likely fit into an NHL roster a lot more quickly and be the better player long term as well as the bigger leader the better overall player and again having Slavkowski over him because of a couple a couple of Olympic goals versus terrible national teams to me is jumping the gun quite a bit especially when you compare the rankings beforehand where in the mid-season ranking Slavkowski was fifth he wasn't close to being considered for number one but again because of the world championships because of the Olympics Slavkowski is at that number one spot you guys know back in the 2019 draft I had Capo Caco number one and the similarities are striking I think Slavkowski in has maybe better translatable skills than Capo Caco but I think Caco was way more dominant in his draft year and was playing against Against much better competition too and to me I see Slavkowski at the number one spot and I just get the same kind of nightmares that I did back in 2019. And I'd also like to know what you guys think about that number one pick. And again, with Slavkowski being number one, could we see the Habs draft him now? I'm not sure if the community polls and the rankings that we see all over the place really affect things too much. And I do think the Habs are still leaning towards Shane Wright. But we have heard rumors that they are pick, are leaning maybe in Slavkowski's way, or at least there's more, a more close pick to be made there on draft day. But to me, again, Shane Wright is the obvious pick. And uh, looking at my rankings, looking at everything, the only player that I'd even consider to taking number one instead is Logan Cooley, not Uri Slavkowski. I get where the Habs might be coming from, but you can have 
a lot more of a great thing. Yes, Nick Suzuki is kind of along the same lines as Shane Wright, but to me, Shane Wright will likely be better than Suzuki, and to me, if you have two dominant two-way centermen, that's not a bad thing. That's actually how the best teams are built. I mean, you look at the Colorado Avalanche, David McKinnon and Nazem Kadri, look at the, at the Tampa Bay Lightning with Point and Stamkos over the years. You really can use two dynamic centermen and two dynamic top six centermen in your group. We see time and time again how that's been the case. 2019 with the Blues, Shannon Ryan O'Reilly, a 2018, you see such a big resurgence with Kuznetsov and, and Evgeny ba and, and Backstrom. You see these top two centermen being so impactful, and to me, Shane Wright and, 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 and Nick Suzuki would be perfect for each other. Now, that's all I have to say on the matter, because again, I think Montreal will likely take him, and I think they will take him number one and should take him number one, but there still is a lot more list to go through, and we have an entire first round to talk about. Now, going on to the top five of the Bob McKenzie rankings, of course, with Uri Slavkowski being number one, Shane Wright was likely to be the second overall pick, and that's what we see here. And again, it was indicated by Bob McKenzie that, was a, that it was super slim, and, and the margins were basically nothing, so the guys were basically tied. But again, that just comes into question why Slavkowski would be the number one choice for so many NHL scouts, with, of course, Shane Wright being number two. Logan Cooley would end up going to number three, which I think is fine. I have number two, but I can see where some concerns might lie with his with his with his two-way game and some inconsistencies there. But at number four, you have Simone Nemetz, which I think is a really interesting uh, selection there. He's a guy that I think could go really high in this draft, and I think should go pretty high. Still in my top five, and I think going at number four that would be an interesting selection if it were to be Seattle, for instance. And then the biggest surprise besides Slavkovsky number one in this top five is American Cutter Gauthier. Now Cutter Gauthier, I'm not really surprised would be in a top ten and even around that fifth spot, but to be in that top five above other players like David Juracek, players like Matthew Savoy, I think is definitely an interesting selection. And I mean, I, at the very recent uh, mock drafts that I, I've been coming up with, uh, I've had potentially Cutter Goche going to the Ottawa Senators at number seven. But with this mock draft, he could be gone before then. And just imagine the Philadelphia Flyers skipping on Juracek to select Goche. That could be the craziness that we see on draft day. And again, we could see Goche even going higher than that. Imagine Arizona instead goes for him. That's a player that could fit well, even if it wouldn't be my pick. So that just, again, shows how wide open this draft is. So then we move on to the 6 through 10 rankings, and at number 6, you have David Juracek slotting in there. Even though uh, I would have him over Uri uh, I would have him over uh, Co uh, Gauthier, I would still have Juracek at number 6 on my draft rankings. Then at number 7, you have Joaquin Kamel, who has had his ups and downs, is minus 4 from the last uh, mock draft, which of course was the mid-season one. That makes sense with his injuries and the inconsistencies in the Liga that he had in the second half. But I still think it's a little bit too high for Kamel, but I do think that spot is generally where he could go. Then you got Jonathan Lekaramaki, who's plus four since the last rankings. He's a guy that's also had a great World Junior, so that has had a great last few months. He's a player that I definitely could see going in that top 15, definitely going a lot higher than most people expect. Again, I could see the Sens taking him at that spot at number seven, but there's a lot of options for Lekaramaki. He could go very high, not really surprising there. But then you have Matt Savoy at number nine. So Matthew Savoy dropping down five spots from the mid uh, rankings, which I think is I think uh, a somewhat usual take. I think Savoy around that spot is what most people expect, um, and especially in the draft, I could see Savoy dropping quite a bit. Even though I think he should go inside that top ten and top eight. Then going on to the tenth spot, though, you got Austrian centerman Marco Casper jumping up seven spots since the mid mid season rankings, and that also makes a lot of sense. He's got I. I could see going to that send spot at number seven. That to me is a pretty realistic pick. But with Casper, he's had a, again another great resurgence in the SHL in the second half. He's a guy though that I think as a top ten pick wouldn't be a slam dunk, but would not surprise me whatsoever right now. Now going on to some more interesting picks. Number eleven is Kevin Korchinski, who I have around the twenty to twenty one range. He jumps up fourteen spots since the mid season rankings. He's a guy that brings so much electricity, so much offense, and a a lot of fantastic skill. There are some concerns there, but number 11 does surprise me, actually. Even though he had a great playoffs and was a part of that great Thunderbirds team, I didn't expect him to be this high, especially for a player that is so offensively uh, oriented in his game. But 
at number 11, that would be interesting to see happen. You also got Pavel Mintyukov, who has been a favorite of mine, up four spots to number 12. I see him definitely going around that range, pretty realistic. One of my favorite defensemen of this draft, and I think one of the most dynamic offensively and consistently. I think he'll translate well, and at number 12, I think that's a very fair spot for him. At number 13 is Connor Geeky. This was a player that I was really interested to see where he would be in this ranking, because he generally seems to be a lot higher up to the general class, the more NHL focused class than maybe people that are looking at just the potential by itself. With Geeky, he drops down three spots, was 10 in the mid midseason rankings. Although I still think it's a little bit high for Geeky, considering how inconsistent he is and how he doesn't use his physicality nearly enough and how I think his speed just is not there. A lot of scouts still see that size, they see that passing ability, and they see that awareness and still love it, and I could see why. You also got Daniel Yurov at number 14, who dropped six spots, number eight in the mid ranking. And to me, if Yurov, he's another huge wild card. If he gets more playing time, he could be a player that really booms or busts. At number 14, I don't really have much of a problem with it. And then number 15, this was a player that I was also really interested in. Frank Nazer, for some reason, down a spot, which considering he was 14th in, in the mid mid season ranking is a little bit confusing to me. I don't know what he did to go down. He had a great second half and offensively, I think, brings so much to the table. But I was also interested to see where he would be if he dropped more than that, considering his size. But I think top 15 is definitely warranted. And I'm glad that scouts are able to see the talent within him. So throughout most of this list, I'm basically reacting to you guys. I'll just click on the link, uh, click on the tweet, and then react to it. I only got a glimpse of this before I saw it, but Brad Lambert, 16th. And I am genuinely surprised here because I was expecting Brad Lambert to maybe be in the second round, be around 30th, I would say at the most. But 16th, I, I think is way less of a drop than I was expecting. Obviously, he drops five spots from the mid-season ranking, but I'm actually genuinely surprised that it's not a lot more. That, to me, is a very promising sign that scouts are still seeing the talent, the speed, the amazing skating, and the amazing projectability of Lambert, even though there is some question marks there. I'm glad to see him still inside the top 20, still inside the top 16. That is a genuine, surprising, happy surprise there. Then going on to number 17, up two spots, Jimmy Snuggerud. I in my, in my late first, I can see where some scouts uh, do see him higher with that C, with that size, with his fantastic defensive game and good physicality. He's going to be a good NHL player. He's going to be a solid one. Not not a, a player that I think moves the needle too much, and that's why I have him in the lower first round, but uh, you're going to get an NHL player there, and I'm not surprised that scouts would have him that high. Up 22 spots, though. I'm just seeing this now. At number 18, Yuri Kulich sent him out of the Czech Republic. That is, or that is just, that is surprising, actually. That is surprising. I didn't have him really being that high. Bye. But that is also another genuinely surprising pick. Even though I, I guess I'm not that high on him now since I have him in my late 20s. This is a player that I think will bring some excellent defensive acumen, be solid in the AIQ, and will be a solid middle six, probably great third line center in the future. That is a surprising upward trend. 22. That's amazing. Then number 19, down 13 spots since the last ranking. Ivan Miroshashenko, obviously dealing with the, uh, with the, with the health issues that have played plagued him there. Down 13 spots, which I think is pretty fair for him. Still a lot of potential there, but uh, yeah, considering he was, what, 16 for, uh, or not 16, 6 or 5 in the mid-season mid rankings, that drop does make sense. Then number 20, down 5 spots is Isaac Howard. Not as much of a drop-off as I really expected. I do still like Isaac Howard quite a bit. I have him just outside my first round, but I love the skill there. I love the tenacity, and I love the quickness, but there is still some question marks in the projectability on oh, the overall game there, but Overall, the top 20, not as crazy as I was expecting. I was expecting some ma more major drop-offs, especially with Brad Lambert. But honestly, besides Slavkovsky, number one, and a couple other questionable picks, not the worst ranking I've ever seen. And then going on after the number 20 park, or at least after the uh, top 20. At number 21, you got Liam Ogren up two spots from the mid-season ranking. He's a player I have in my top 15. Love his projectability. Such an already mature game at such a young age. And I think his passing and overall skill set will improve quite a bit in the next few years. At number 21, not really many complaints about that. Up 29 spots, though, from the last ranking, Noah Osland at number 22. This is, I remember, one of the more confusing and interesting picks of the midseason ranking. They had him in the second round, which I did not agree with whatsoever, but he's up 29 spots, and obviously the big world juniors he had, I think that was one of the main components there. But you guys know I love Noah Osland as a centerman. I think he'll project well that position and be one 
one of the best centermen in this draft, has such a high ceiling. I think one of the highest ceilings of this draft, although there is some question marks with his in tight speed and especially his physicality in the neutral zone. If he's able to bulk up, to me, this is a top six centerman and a fantastic one too. So I'm glad to see him inside the top 25. Then number 23, you got Owen Pickering up 13 spots. Interesting he's above Denton Metichuk. That's an interesting pick. I mean, with Owen Pickering, there's a lot of talent there with his big frame. There's a lot of transition uh, spectacular, uh, not spectacular, a lot of uh, transition uh, masterful play in him. He's such a great transitional player with the puck, especially he's able to get out of his zone so efficiently with his skating. There is still some question marks there, but the potential is sky high for him. And then you got Denton Metiachuk at number 24, up five spots. He's another player that has tons of potential, but I think he's also a little bit of a boomer bust. I think he's getting away with a lot that he's not going to get away with at the pro level, but there is still a lot that he's trying out. He's one of the most creative players of this draft. Then you got Ryan Chesley down seven spots at number 25. I'm kind of surprised he's down this, uh, this high. I guess it's more so just players that are playing better than him. I think at number 25, that's pretty realistic to where he could go, but I could see him also going in the top 20 as well. Then jumping up nine spots, they got my boy number 26, Liam Bichel. Love to see that. A little bit surprised he's also not a little bit higher considering just his stature and, and how much scouts love that. But to me, Bichel, solid skater, one of the best skaters for his frame at six foot five. Such a good one there. One of the best physical players of this draft. Loves to get big hits out there. And defensively, there's so much potential with his wide range and overall quickness on his skates. To me, I'd, I'd select him a little bit higher than this. And I, I think at number 26, though, to get some credit that he deserves, that is great to see. And now to round out the top 32, you have number 27, Rucker McGrody, who only drops one spot, which I'm pretty happy about. I think he's a first round prospect. You guys know I have him in my top 20. I think there's a lot there that is just kind of held back by average and subpar skating. If he gets a skating coach, I think he could be kind of along the same lines as Jason Robertson, where you see that smartness, you see that that, that just that mind really get to work. And as, as a sentiment, as a forward, I think there's so much potential there for an overall game and a top mid, uh, middle six player here that I just love him. You also got Navin Gauthier at number 28, which I think is, is interesting. He's down eight spots, which is also a little bit fascinating. I kind of considered him to be in that top 25 for most scouts out there. Um, but yeah, I think that range is also pretty realistic. At number 29, you got Luca Del Balbaluz at number 29, up eight spots from the last ranking. That's one of the more interesting ones. I've kind of seen him all over the place. I think he's mostly considered, though, as a second or third round prospect. But if he's a first round pick, that is one heck of a bet to make. There is potential there. I do like his speed, but there's a lot that I'm not really sure will translate to the pro or NHL level. But if you're able to unlock it, he could be first round talent. There's just some big question marks there. Then at number 30, down eight spots, is Philip Mishar. I, I would kind of have him around that range as well. I, I would have him higher, but uh, I can see where some concerns might lie. I, I still like his efficiency. I still love how he creates offense. But again, there is some physicality that will need to be improved upon there. And number 31, up 16 spots, though, is Sam Renzel. In my opinion, one of the worst defensive, defen uh, defensive defensemen of this draft. Has great size, has great potential in his transition and, and, and speed game. is pretty good, but I also do think he gets blown by way too much on, on a defensive defending rushes, and there is still some some smarts to be learned there, but I do think if he gets in the right system, he could turn out pretty well. And then at number 32, you got Tristan Leno down 11 spots. I think that's pretty realistic. He's a guy that I think has just not a lot of projectability. He gets beat a little bit too much in the QM JHL, which is not exactly where you want to get beat too much. Um, he's kind of a guy that I could see panning out as a bottom, a bottom pair guy, but at the most, that's, and I think there's a big chance that he just doesn't make anything really happen at the pro level. Level. We'll see what happens, but that is the top 32 of Bob McKenzie's 2022 final rankings. A lot of craziness, a lot of wackiness, but overall, not the worst ranking I've seen in the world. There is some things I obviously disagree with. There is some high rankings that I don't quite see, but at the same time, considering just how much could be different, it's kind of similar to my rankings in a lot of different ways. Like, I, I consider Rucker McGrody to be a lot lower. I considered Brad Lambert to be a lot lower. Different players that have a lot less... Um 
a lot less momentum right now are still pretty high in the ranking, which I'm, I'm kind of happy about. There is still some question marks there. I don't have Slavkowski number one. I don't see it. But at the same time, I could see where some people are coming from there. So overall, not the worst ranking in the world. There is still some some questionable picks. But at the same time, I, I've, I've, I think I've disagreed quite a bit more on some other rankings in the past. And this one seems a little bit more tame in comparison. But I'll just say this. Montreal, take Shane Wright for the love of everything whole. So if you guys didn't see, in the last video, we ended up doing a 55k giveaway where you guys could have won a Stars beanie and the 2018 Carolina Hurricanes draft hat for 55k celebration. And I'm giving the, uh, the mission to you guys to put Austin Matthews MVP in the comments to see who would get the win and to see who would win the contest for those two prizes. So... We'll see who wins it. The comment must contain Austin Matthews MVP, and we will pick a winner now. Who will it be? And it is Sean Pinman. Sean Pinman is your winner. Austin Matthews MVP. Sean, email me uh, at nathanmerds at gmail.com. Give me your address. Give me your every, all the info there, and I'll be able to send the items as quick as humanly possible. But Sean is your winner, and congratulations for winning the 55K giveaway. But that'll be it for today, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you did enjoy, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell. Comment down below, what are your thoughts on Bob McKenzie's top 32 rings? What would you agree and what would you disagree with? And what would be your rankings as well? Do you think the Habs should take your Slavkovsky first overall? Let me know your thoughts down below. Of course, share this video with your friends. Get it out there to any hockey fans you guys know online. Click this card for all my hockey prospects rankings right one on right playlist. My name is Nathan. Have a great day, and I'll see you in the next one one. Goodbye.